Welcome to the first episode of our Passion de las Passiones series, everybody. We've got designer Brandon Leon Cambetta here with us today, as well as good friend and Magpie Games GM, Elspeth Denman. But before we get to the amazing discussion about this game in this episode, here's what you can expect after the show. You can join us back here in our call to action to hear about Girl Scout cookies being on sale again. Mm. Our new Undying Bonds episode from last week. A new patron joined us since last time, so we will be thanking them personally. And our other standard episode reminders and things as usual that are less interesting than all those other things I just said. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, well, until then, enjoy the show, everybody. Welcome to Character Creation Cast, a show where we discuss and create characters, the best part of role-playing games, with guests using their favorite systems. I'm one of your hosts, Ryan. In this episode, my co-host Amelia and I are thrilled to welcome back Brandon Langambetta and Elspeth Denman. Brandon's pronouns are he, him, and Elspeth's pronouns are she, her. Brandon and Elspeth have been two previous guests all the way back from Series 2 our Masks series five years ago. Mm -hmm. This series, we are going to be covering Brandon's game, Passion de las Passiones, a Powered by the Apocalypse game that lets you bring to life your very own telenovelas. Welcome back to Character Creation Cast. I'm really excited. We haven't actually sat down and recorded with you two since before the show yes. released. Um, oh, that's true. Because we, oh, yeah. we released series one and two right away, like on our first... Um, our first mm -hmm. outing. So I'm really excited. You can see how professional we've become. <laughs> I'm it's, so it's excited very about legit. this. <laughs> it is, I got to say, it's next level. I, I've been on a whole bunch of podcasts. First off, I'm so happy to be back. So happy to be chatting with two of you. So, Elspeth, always happy to be hanging out. Yeah, yeah. Uh, fine. Yeah, yeah. But, like, you know, <laughs> we talk we, all the we time. We talked them into being here at the same time. <laughs> well, <laughs> honestly, hard uh, to do. <laughs> all, with our schedules. Yes, right? yeah. Truly. <laughs> Um, but so happy to be here and and uh, truly next level levels of uh, of like uh, perfectly outlined various different colors on the page. Um, if anything gets screwed up, it's because of one of the guests. <laughs> like cl clearly, you, gonna gonna you, own you, that you right now. You underestimate us. <laughs> he speaks for us because he's right. <laughs> Hello, my name is Amelia and I'm a type A. I am the order Muppet of this operation. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, Brandon, do you want to tell us a little bit more about yourself, uh, where people can find you online and about your projects? Yeah, sure. Uh, I'm Brandon Leon Gambetta. I uh, design some games. I do some podcasting. Um, you can find me on the Stop Back and Roll Network at Stop Back and Roll. Uh, we did a Masks podcast a while back um, that's on uh, in Indeterminate mm. Hiatus, uh, Protean City Comics, uh, which pioneered uh, podcasts calling themselves Blank City Comics. Uh, <laughs> I'm also the author of Puzzle. <laughs> <laughs> Shade. <laughs> with all love. No, 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 no. With all love. Dude, with kidding. all love. Uh, I, I, there are so many pod of mask podcasts I listen to <laughs> to this day that have that same like setup. And I'm like, oh, <laughs> lineage. <laughs> That's what, so uh, uh, I also wrote uh, Pasión de los Pasiones, a PBTA game. Uh, I joke that it's um, uh, Apasionado por el Apocalipsis uh, because it's a, it's a little different, a little stranger. Uh, and, uh, very much based on my, uh, my Peruvian heritage. Uh, I'm online at B. Leon Gambetta on the Burning Bird <laughs> site. And, uh, other places I'm either B. Leon Gambetta or BLG if the population on the site is low enough. So like, that's you know, <laughs> like Mastodon and co-host, it's like, yeah, I'm that's BLG. A, that's a good pull. Uh, <laughs> I was pumped. I, mean, I don't use it. Right. I don't use it because those sites are not. But it's there's no mine. one there. But I it's know. mine uh -huh. in case it becomes big. Yeah, I went on and like got ginger reckoning everywhere. You got because I was like, it. this is mine. Yeah. <laughs> 
Uh, and the, the only other thing I've really got going on is um is uh, I'm, I'm working on a little uh, tactics mini skirmish game called Rad Crawl uh, that is going to probably come out relatively yeah. soon. It did. Very that's that's cool. kind of it. That's, that's kind of what I'm yeah. doing. Oh, that's it. No, no big deal. Yeah. Just, just that's like, like nothing, couple. Brandon. God. <laughs> <That's> like, <laughs> well, that list Get used to be busy, much longer. Uh, I've been paring it down and becoming <laughs> becoming more more manageable Absolutely. with it. I'm trying to be like a real human sometime in your spare right. time. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> well, uh, Elspeth, how about yourself? Oh, my list is so much shorter. Um, you can find me on all the internets, um, except for the Dying Bird site. <laughs> Um, at Elspeth DZ, D's and dogs, Z's and zebra. Um, you can hear my voice on the Stop Pack and Roll Network on that little show called Protein City Comics. Um, also, we did a little comic offshoot that I ran called Outstanding, which I love. And if you want a little taste of masks in a shorter, um, what am I trying to say? Session, yeah. So shorter amount of sessions, um, you can check that out. Um, I also uh, wrote and produced with my husband a, a scripted anthology podcast, which has won a couple of awards recently, I'm very proud of, called Dark Valley. You can find that anywhere that you get your podcasts or darkvalleypod.com. Um, and if you want to play Passion with me, you can hit me up on the curated play program at magpiegames.com, where I regularly run um, my favorite games, which happen to be this one. Um, so if you want to play Passion with me, check out the curated play program. Absolutely. I think that's it. All right, Ryan, note to self. Yep. Uh, go ahead and do that because we have not gotten to play this game yet. <laughs> no, we have not. <laughs> oh my gosh, you don't have to hire me for it. It's fine. I'll <laughs> play with you. I've had the ash can of this game on my shelf for how many years now? For years. Years. Gotta, gotta be for years. Like five years? I mm -hmm. don't know. Like, I think, I mean, honestly, I think I got it shortly after we first recorded with mm -hmm. you. And I think so. I think I, I remember. I still haven't when you gotten got that. to play it. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's so much different from the ash yeah. can at this point. It's, it is a clean, mean fighting machine at this point compared to the Absolutely. ash can. I think the only time I've actually played it was a one shot, and it was. Would we even call that a beta test? I think it was like an alpha test over drunk brunch that we all had. And there were like 10, 10 players, poor Brandon. And we we're wow. all like drinking mimosas at 11. And yeah. that was the only time I've actually ever made a character and played it. I think that that was pre-Ashcan. Um, yeah. Because I think that because uh, it had um, we had La Pirata in, in yes, the crew. Yes, correct. Uh, and like we had several playbooks that no longer mm. exist. Mm -hmm. uh, or that have been like dramatically changed for mm -hmm. Tormentas in and have like required entire rewrites from the ground up. So yeah. that was early. I don't even know if there was questions. Oh, it was questions at that point. It was questions, questions was and we early, had audience participation thing. at the time. Yeah. Um, yes. Yeah. That was a big thing. And then we made characters at um, Metatopia at 2 a.m., and, yes, and then got kicked, and out, got of the kicked hall. out of the hall. So I didn't get to play that one, which was going to be good. Like, I'm glad for you because James and I were doing twin stuff and it was going to be like really problematic for yeah, everyone. It was going to it was going to be very hard. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so this will be the first uh, character I've made in quite some time. Well, I'm glad to know that you and James didn't ruin the game so badly. At that point, that Brandon like gave no. up. And I mean, we try no our best. We are when poor Brandon having to like wrangle the two of us. We make each other worse and better. Oh no, I, lo I love running for the two of you. You two are so fun to play with. Amazing. Well, I am all excited to hear about all the changes uh, since the Ashcan edition. Uh, so let's go ahead and get into this, and we will start by discussing what this game is all about. What's in a game? So, what is the core concept of Passion de las Passiones? Yeah, someone else can field this. Yeah, I was going to say, yeah, I'm definitely <laughs> equipped to answer uh, well, this question. I'm, I'm happy to answer that for you. <laughs> oh, <I> was... <laughs> uh, so, Passion de las Passiones is a game about playing telenovelas. Um, a telenovela is a specific type of soap opera. It's a Latino soap opera that is... Uh, that is these these short instead of thinking of like you know the, the huge sprawling never end have no idea where the plot is going things telenovelas are tele they're on tv novelas they're novelas they're they're short they've got exactly what's going to be in them and so you get a specific storyline that runs through it really really intentionally 
Um, mm. Because of that, they need to have things happening really, really, really fast. There is no space for like four episodes where someone goes and and does like a side thing that doesn't matter. Like, you know, we're we're in it. And so these these shows move very quickly. And so you, you get like romance and betrayal happening episode after episode. You can end up like feeling like, oh, yeah, I'm definitely uh, like I, I'm Team Juan. I'm Team Juan. And then like two episodes later, you're like, I cannot wait for Juan to die. And then <laughs> yeah. an episode and a half later, you're sobbing because Juan just died. <laughs> and so that's really, really the focus of it is is intending to have the experience of sitting and watching a telenovela and playing the characters in the telenovela kind of at the same time. So this is something that really is going to be extremely dramatic, like mm -hmm. high drama. And, the most. And quick paced, right? So yeah. like we're not doing tons of like, you know, eight eight sessions of traveling from here to there. And, you know. Yeah. yeah. If planning is happening at your table, uh, you, you've lost you've lost a little bit of the the focus and and you need to go like okay not planning let's act and so like, the moves in the game are really designed to encourage you to move without thinking mm -hmm. uh, and do the thing and justify things later and figure things out you know later on who cares we'll, we'll get back to it oh my gosh I love that honestly in a game that doesn't like initially equip characters with like swords and pointy things to stab each other with like the mm -hmm. amount of murder attempts and successful murders that have <laughs> happened in games of passion like i can't even count them all there's so many times of like intentional <laughs> player conflict it's just mm -hmm. and then those people were like kissing 20 seconds ago and probably will be after you know like it's just amazing as soon as it turns out that that he didn't actually die, he didn't. Uh, he, you know, it, yeah, it was his twin. It was just his twin, which <laughs> happens yeah. all the time, Brent. <laughs> I digress. Continue. But then you fall was, in love with his ghost, and then it's a whole, oh, whole thing. No, exactly. Exactly. He's only scabbed a little bit. It's fine, <laughs> right? I mean, I love that though because I think I've played in so many games where you know, and this is this is part of that like sort of antagonistic GM player dynamic that I already don't love, but where players sit around and are trying to like plan and plot and like sort of outsmart what things that the GM has planned. And you, you end up mm -hmm. spending a whole session just trying to like figure out how we're going to like, you know, like walk through these doors or something like that. Yeah. And this is a game that does not want that. Like no, you just, just kick those doors down. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The the doors need to be kicked open because if you open them any other way, it isn't dramatic enough. Right. <laughs> you know, like uh, if, if the door doesn't slam when it opens, then then how would they even know that you're in the room? Uh -huh. You can always just fall through the ceiling in a bathtub. I've had that happen also. Like there's other oh. ways to enter the room <laughs> dramatically. I think I think on one shot, and this would have been with the ash can, um, they someone jumped in through a skylight. Yes. Excellent. Uh, yes. I think directly Correct. into a wrestling move. Oh. <laughs> sounds yep. about right. Yeah, that's right. yeah, sounds good. I'd buy it. <laughs> I had a I had a player um, try to commit murder by using a violin note to sh uh, shatter a glass to cut the string on a chandelier and land in the audience of an opera house. Amazing. <laughs> yeah. Perfect. That is perfect. Mm -hmm. Yep. Mm -hmm. To go off of that, uh, what kind of doors are we kicking in? Like, what what kind of setting are you playing this game in? So that that's actually one of the things that um that I'm I'm very proud of uh, with this game is uh, we pushed. This is not like there there is nothing new. There's nothing new, right? No no one has ever created a no one has created a new thing in hundreds of years. Um, and in in games, no one is going to make a new thing yet uh, ever, right? You right, everything's been done at this point. Uh, we're all remixing we're, and changing up how it works. Um, we're really focusing one thing on play sets, which is a uh, two page, uh, like front and back page that essentially says, what is the genre of your show? Mm -hmm. um, and we're doing it very directly in like, uh, th this is uh, uh, El Sabor del Amor. This is this is the flavor of love. Uh, it is cooking and and romance and and it's light and bubbly, but like that is a type that is like a genre of telenovela. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. In uh in in future stuff, we're going to be introducing more like kind of off the beaten path things. And the real focus is that no matter what telenovela you're playing, 
there are specific things that show up in all of them. There's specific ways that people handle problems. And so kind of the genre and the track, like the, the setting, the trappings, none of that matters as much as the core thrust of these are desperate characters, desperately in love, desperately hating each other, desperately trying to get what they need, um, making big swings and big decisions. Um, and so like, this isn't in the core game because we weren't able to fit it all in one book. Um, but like the, the supplement is going to include, um, is going to include a, a, like a wild west, uh, cowboys mm -hmm. kind of thing. Mm -hmm. It's going to include vampires. It's going to include, um, I think it's going to, going to include like a, uh, like a cartel kind of setting. Mm -hmm. Um, and so you can do all of these different things within the game and play sets are really easy to make. Um, it was really important to, to me that, we kept play sets as a thing that any GM could sit down, make for their table Ooh. for a single game, and they'd be perfectly happy with it, or make for a single table and then turn it around and go, hey, here's a game you can play. Here's a, uh, a mm -hmm. telenovela that, that I've created the setting for. Go. Yeah. yeah, here's something fun. I think you'd like it, too. Yeah. 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 Um, all, all nerds here uh, ran it in space. Amazing. Uh, Amazing. With, like... I, which I, I'm so excited. I want to, I still need to talk to to them and, and figure out how I can make sure that they get like an actual play set of that out when the time comes. But, uh, but you can do these different things and it still works because the, the, the heart of the game is, is the drama and the way of handling mm. problems. Yeah. It seems it's much more about like the themes and the interpersonal dynamics than it is about exactly. like where it's set. Yeah, like I've joked that like uh, one thing that's been very funny is that uh, D and D's very bad OGL day has happened at the exact same time as uh, Pasión de los Pasiones is release, and so because of that, people are going like uh, like you know uh, Amelia. This is not me calling you out, Amelia, <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, because I've been seeing a ton of people say like, oh like, for sure. If you're if you're suggesting like you know, someone move away from the I just actively mentioned yours. Yes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and you're not the only one. Um, I've seen like four or five different people go like, if you're suggest like you know if you're moving people away from D and D, don't go like Pasión de los Pasiones. It's a right. totally different game. And I'm like, unless they want to kiss unless. while if in dungeons. If they want to kiss, yeah. <laughs> yes. Right. right. Uh, so so what I'm what I'm hearing <laughs> with all of this is it's not too far gone that I could make a magical girl play set for oh this. Oh my god, please, 100%. yeah. I don't see any reason why not. Oh my goodness. Um, there's, uh, like, uh, I, I, I have only aimed for, like, the things that are existing telenovelas. Like, there, mm -hmm. there's a play set that is just, like, uh, Quien Mato a Mer uh, I, oh no, what's that? Quien Mato a Sarah? Uh, the, the Netflix uh, telenovela that came out recently. It's mm. just that. Like <laughs> anyone who has seen that show will read this and go like, wow, we're playing one show. And it's mm -hmm. like, yeah, because that show was really interesting <laughs> in the way that they handled things. And I wanted to see if we could do it, too. Um, but I don't see any reason that you couldn't. Like, you know, you'd want some magical girl moves because needless to say, it doesn't come with any natively. <laughs> but uh, but uh, that's what the play sets do is they add a couple moves. They make it like, you know, if you're playing cowboys, you want to be able to duel in the street. If you're playing mm. uh, in the steamy kitchen, you want to be able to cook a meal together and get all get all sexy doing that. I love this. I love it. Sexy meal. Oh, so much. So much. <laughs> well, uh, aside from the play sets, what sort of tools do we need to to play this game? Oh. I feel like I'm talking all the time. Do you want to do you <laughs> want to take this out? I mean, it's your game. You know you're this. allowed. You, you run more games than I do. <laughs> I run this game. <laughs> sure. You need some friends. You need a GM. You need, <laughs> no, I got this. Um, you need your playbook. You need 2D6 um, or a dice roller. Uh, lately through the pandemic, while this game has been sort of being run through the curated play, I've been using a beautiful spreadsheet that kind of helps everybody out via Zoom. But if you're doing it on a table, you want your playbook, you want something to write with, 2D6, a card to label your character, and um, willingness to have a good time and kiss some people. Yeah. Open mind. <laughs> um, as a GM, I think going into this, you should have the idea, or at least I've talked to Brandon about this and why I love Passion so much and why it's so much fun to run, is I'm also a player. Um, and my job is more a chess master of the characters interacting with each other than it is mm -hmm. of creating any kind of conflict 
out of thin air for them. I'm listening to what they're doing and I'm trying to organically push them together in conflict ways um, and see what they do because sometimes they lean into that conflict and sometimes they reject it completely and go in a completely different direction. But my job is to create opportunities for growth together or growth apart Mm -hmm. um, for the characters. So when you were talking about the antagonistic kind of competitive relationship between a GM and, and their players, like trying to outwit or outplay each other, That's kind of not a thing in this game because Mm -hmm. really it sings the best when the GM is part of the team and says, okay, I see this boiling. How can I aggravate it? Or I see this, these two characters like having these lusty looks at each other. How can I give them an opportunity to explore that? Or um, so as a GM, I think you need to come in with no ego Huge Mm -hmm. admirations for (laughs) your players and like be their biggest cheerleader and just um, the idea that you're not creating this for them to play in. You're all doing it together. Even playing. It it kind of feels like the GM is kind of taking the role of a catalyst. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. That's totally what it is. Yeah. The components and you put it all together and explosions of uh, romance and murder happen. And I, I've i talked to Brandon about this too. Like, I don't know if this was something he had in mind at the time, but I've run it a bunch of times and it is just the single most joy-filled game ever. And I have so much fun and such a smile on my face playing it the whole time that I don't realize I'm a GM. Like, I don't feel like I'm in that seat. I feel very much a part of it. Um, mm-hmm. which is why when today we were making characters, I was like, have I done that? I don't know if I've done that. <laughs> <laughs> I love games, though, that really facilitate that interaction with GMs, though. And I'm I'm mm-hmm. seeing more and more of them that are like part of character creation is sort of offering your GM all of these different strings to pull on. And that based on the decisions that you make in character creation, you're very much signaling to your GM, these are the things that I'm interested in. In these are the the themes and stories that I want to explore. Um, have at it, and I I yeah. like games that give the opportunity for that for a GM to be your cheerleader and to help facilitate the kind of experience that players are either explicitly or implicitly asking mm-hmm. for by showing up with these characters. And I feel like this game, having read through it a few times, like this game does that. It's like here's here's all of the flaws. Here's all of the weird stuff I have going on. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Make it happen. Like bring drama, (laughs) you know? Yeah. I think there's so many games that, you know, and this is not knocking like a combat driven game at all. Mm -hmm. Cause there's a, there's a joy in that too. But when you make a character for a combat driven game and you put all this like juice into their genesis and like who they are and why they are, and then it never gets touched on, you kind of forget Mm -hmm or I do, I kind of forget when it like just kind of fades off into the background. But like this game, you you have a very concrete person in mm-hmm. front of you and to not lean into that and pick it apart is like to the detriment of the fun of everyone. Mm-hmm. So the more, yeah. the more juice you put into your character and the more the GM pays attention to that and kind of mixes it up, the more fun it is. It's wild. Yeah, it's a, a wild ride. A thing that we end up talking a lot about, too, is, you know, like there are lots of people who come from D&D or something and are like, my story at my table was so dramatic. Or like you look at something like Critical Role where they're mm-hmm. like all of these like crazy plot points are happening and all that kind of stuff. And and you look at it and you say, well, that's that's in spite of the game mechanics. Yeah. Like it's very right. cool that you're, you're adding the that. experience, but that isn't what the like that isn't the game doing that and and this game is like no here here is the drama here is all of the backstory Mm -hmm. stuff that's what this game is about is doing those things one of the things i hear the most doing the curated play with people who have not played this game and are nervous because that's Mm -hmm. uh you know a lot of people are walking into this with not a lot of um I certainly didn't have a lot of telenovela experience. I watched Jane the Virgin and loved it. That and that so was, that, that so was, good. so me coming to Brandon being like, which character in Jane the Virgin is this? Help. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> that was really honest, yeah. Uh, this uh, one's Petra. I, I just need help. <laughs> um, but one of the things I tell people when they're feeling nervous about the, ga- the game is that if you pay attention to your playbook and just 
don't try to break the playbook. Just lean into what it's telling you. You're going to do it by accident. You're going to end up monologuing before you know it. You're going to end up bearing your feelings to someone, expressing love passionately. Like you are going to do these things by accident and you'll be rewarded. But the game, toot toot, Brandon, uh, that the game really uh, pulls it out of you, even if you don't know what you're doing. So like it holds your hand the whole way. So there's no reason to be nervous that you don't know the source material because it's going to happen anyway. That's a really beautiful thing about the way PBTA games work too. Yeah, we talked totally. about that mm-hmm. I think a lot when we when we covered Chimera. Um Amor was saying that like Chimera was sort of born out of this idea that like PBTA games do one genre really specifically mm-hmm. really well. Um and so I think that like that that is an advantage of this kind of game especially when you don't know all that much about the genre is that the playbook does a lot of that heavy lifting mm-hmm. for you and is like okay here's here's your trope you can live in this yeah. box and i have i have made it comfortable mm-hmm. for you and like handed you all the tools that you need to play in this particular genre and in a lot of ways like not not to be like not, not to be falsely going like <laughs> pretending that I'm not like totally full of myself because I am. <laughs> um, but this this game is built on the shoulders of giants. Mm-hmm. You know, like like the reason these tropes work is because they have been refined because they are in a lot of ways recognizable mm-hmm. to everybody. Mm-hmm. Like one of the first things that uh, w- when Passion started getting around, one of the first things people started saying is like, hey, can this do K-drama? Uh, and I was like, so I've never seen K-drama in my life, and I don't know. Um, I'd love it if you hack it. I'd love it if you make your own game of it. Like, you know, please do, because, like, you know, that sounds amazing. And they're like, oh, no, when I asked that, I meant it can do K-drama, um, and I'm going to hack it. And I was like, yes, good, cool. <laughs> uh, and, like, those these tropes, these characters are really, really recognizable. Like, even some of them are a little telenovela-specific, like, there's Lime Playata that is um, uh, someone who's like like poorer and uh, a worker mm-hmm. uh, as opposed to like just wealthy and yeah. hanging around in luxury mm-hmm. uh, who is torn between two lovers. And that is an extremely specific telenovela trope. Yeah. It is also all over the place in other places. And there's parts of it that are recognizable whether you know telenovelas or not. Mm-hmm. And so what. I've had to do what what I did with this game and what I think made a, a lot of this really easy to do is taking those tropes that are so recognizable and are in every story thing. Like, you know, you can take you can take any movie you like and apply it to Pasión de los Pasiones because these tropes are are simple and they are like innate ingrained tropes in our society and in many, many societies uh, and uh, then just put it on. Uh, PBTA Mm -hmm. going like what are the things that playing these tropes will make you do and what are the mechanics that what are what are the results that we want to see when those things happen which is just again going back to the tropes going back to what we expect to see in the media Mm -hmm. so going off of that to can you know continue here like one of our questions is what kind of stories and themes is this game meant to explore are there specific tropes of telenovelas that you were like i i need this thing to be in here um especially Absolutely. in ways that I, i'm interested in ways too that differs from like other dramatic storytelling um you know like even american soap operas or something like that what about telenovelas where you like this i want to emulate this <laughs> so i i wanted things to be quick i wanted like for things to resolve fast right and i wanted emotions to be at the forefront of everything mm-hmm. um and uh, there's a, there's so many there's so many moving pieces that that have aimed to try to get this. Um, you, you know, the, an example might be helpful for this actually. Um, if you don't mind me, my taking taking a second no. to to get game design yes. and get a little <laughs> in, into the crunch. We love it. We love it. Um, so there are one, two, three, four. I should know this. There are eight basic moves that are like the kind of your core basic moves. And there's a couple more that are also in there in the mix, but there's eight that are kind of your, your big ones. Um, and one of those eight is express your love passionately. Mm -hmm. So when you're looking at your sheet that tells you expressing my love passionately is something I should be doing because of the eight buttons I have. One of them is express my love passionately. Mm -hmm. 
Um, and when you do that, you roll with the questions, are you dressed to impress? And do they believe that you are single? Mm-hmm. Uh, and those questions <laughs> do a ton of the heavy lifting of how this game brings you into the themes and how this game leads you into the themes. Um, are you dressed to impress is telling you, hey, guess what? Now is a really great chance for you to describe how hot your character is Mm -hmm. because this is romance. This is over the top. This is dramatic. Like I have been at a table once where someone answered no to are you dressed to impress? Mm. Um, because like I've had, you know, I've had someone just crawl out of the sea after maybe being dead. And they were asked like, are you dressed to impress? And they were like, yeah, I'm in an all white shirt. I'm looking good. Like, you know, my pants are a little ripped. Like, the, the, like little like hair tosses. The, yeah. Like, you know, like the, the white back. sparkles. Off your, yeah. I, I've, I've got a little bit of seaweed <laughs> in my beard and I kind of like take it out and I like toss it to the side in like a big dramatic way. Um, I had a I naked and, character say they were dressed to impress. <laughs> They are. <laughs> I was like, are if you? And he's like, yes, absolutely. I don't, <laughs> I, I don't know what a yes is. Yeah, if it's not perfect. That. Um, but like, like that's a freebie because we want characters in this game to express their love passionately mm-hmm. and we want them to do well at it because that's fun. And so that's a that's a free plus one and it makes them describe their character. Uh, and do they believe you are single? This is like hinting to people, hey, it's hinting two things. One, you know. Think about like how people react to you emotionally. Like, are you trying to find like love, love, like lasting love? Guess what? You've probably got like a and like there's there's some some like uh do they believe that you are single? Uh, it is is has like some complication of like uh whether you actually are or not. I was going to say that is a a complicatedly worded question. Intentionally, like, it's, it's, intentionally, right. yeah. So but you're it, not just um, like. Well, I mean, I didn't tell them I had a boy. It's like, well, you know, did I intentionally not tell yeah. them about somebody or? And so, so it's hinting two things. It's hinting either you succeed by getting, you succeed by honestly chasing love with all of your heart, <laughs> which is totally one of the themes, you know, like uh, good things, good things happening to the people that do good stuff is, is written into the game intentionally. Mm-hmm. Um and uh, like, you know, that's not real life, but that's telenovelas for you. Um, and people lying get ahead <laughs> is also an intentional part of the game. And so like it's you're supposed to you're supposed to lie and cheat and and tell the truth and be vulnerable. And the game will basically force you. And so like, express your love passion is a perfect thing. Uh, do they believe you are single? Yeah, you lie to them and you get a plus one on that. If you roll a plus 10, they're going to tell you the absolute truth whether they love you or not, and who else they love. Uh, And so, like, the game forces truth to come out because that is a big thing of telenovelas, of people lying, people lying, people lying, and then everything's revealed. Mm -hmm. And we we get the revelation, and um, almost like reality show style, uh, suddenly everybody realigns. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so you get these beautiful moments. That's one of my favorite things to see in the game, that, like, alliances have been set, Everybody is like, you know, forming their little relationships. We've got like, you know, we've got a couple over here. We've got a couple over here. We've got uh, a polycule over there. Everybody's doing great. And then one thing comes out and suddenly nobody's involved with the same people anymore. Right. And <laughs> people that are, are just like arch enemies abruptly. Mm-hmm. Uh, and and that's that's kind of the feel is just like throwing it in and shaking stuff up. And uh than seeing what comes out of it. And actually, Ryan, I know it's not in order, but I want to ask my next question here because I feel like it flows. Yeah. Um, one of our questions is is about what makes this game unique. And as we're talking about this, I, I want to ask you about rolling with questions. Yeah. Where sure. that came from, how you feel like it impacts things. And I'd like to talk about some of the questions in here, like that are you dressed to impress? And yeah, sure. know, that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, That's I'm, fun. I love getting into the nitty gritty of this. The questions. Yeah. I love the questions. Uh-huh. It's a genius. I, I, I love them so much I put them in my own game. Yes. So. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um so again, shoulders of giants, you know. Um, it is if this is fate, right? Like the the questions are just fate. Yes. The questions are just dogs in the vineyard. Mm. Um, these it's it it's a different way to word it to make it a little more user friendly. 
not that those games are not user friendly, but like this is designed to be a game that you can say like, hey, Abuela, I know you've never played a tabletop game before, but you sure love your telenovelas. Come sit down. <laughs> right, right. Um, and like early on, I played a, I played a game using questions with let me explain what questions are yes let me let me finish the story quick um (laughs) i played a game with my abuela who has literally she's never played a video game in her life she's never played a tabletop game in her life she's barely plays board games she plays like some bridge but like you know not a gamer Mm -hmm. in any sense of the word and we played a game where she was like a short like 20 minute game where she was like an assassin and she like snuck in and like like killed a rival and like Got it. Got like some Settle bunch down, of money. Abuela. <laughs> like, like she crushed it. And it's because I was just asking her like yes or no questions, rolling some dice. Yep. So that's what the questions do is you have any time you're going to roll a move, you roll three questions. Uh, one is your playbook question, which is basically just another invitation for you to continue to play on trope. And then the two others come from the move which is basically the fictional positioning that you'd want to have in a telenovela in order to be successful on it. For each yes, you get a plus one. For each no, you get a plus zero. And so you can go on that anywhere from a plus zero to a plus three. And then there's conditions also affect stuff. There's additional like things you can have moving up and down. But the core idea is that this is a game that you're against each other. Mm -hmm. And so rolling high more often is not a bad thing because my my victory is your failure and so basically you just get the you get these invitations to stay on trope mm-hmm. and the the intention of the questions the questions are very the the quite I've spent so long on these questions to make sure that they hit what I want them to do mm-hmm. it shows it's yeah Different thank you yeah Jeff kiss so <laughs> um, <laughs> but like as an example like strike out at someone right like your combat move from any game 9 out of 10 times in any game, you're basically asking questions, right? You're asking, hey, are you strong? Uh, Okay, cool. You've got your strength plus three. And you're asking, hey, do you have a cool weapon? Yeah, you've got your weapon plus two. In this, telenovelas don't care if you've got the cooler weapon. They don't care if you're a big, strong, beefy guy. They care if you've caught someone off guard and if they've just wronged Mm -hmm. you. Mm -hmm. We, We don't care if they've got, if you've got a weapon, if they got a weapon. We care about like, is this a dramatically useful moment for you to, to push them down the stairs, even though they've got, you know, 150 pounds yep. of muscle on you. Would the story be cooler if this happened? Exactly. Exactly. I like that they um, they really emphasize the importance of story in these things happening because they they like the answers to them result in narrative information rather than mechanical information. And I think it's really helpful, A, when you're not as familiar with the tropes of mm-hmm. the genre mm-hmm. and B, I think it's really easy to get overwhelmed in these kinds of situations and be like, what would make a good story moment? Like, what Yeah. You know, what should I do? Like, what should I say? How do I mm-hmm. set this scene? And I think the questions are an opportunity to direct players and to give them some guidance on if this is happening, these are the kinds of things that we should be thinking about in this yeah. scene. And I think, you know, when you give that story about, like, playing with your abuela, like, the the way that this would facilitate somebody who doesn't have a familiarity with with role playing games too the way that it helps them understand like what information is important in that moment yeah um and i i feel like questions are so valuable in these situations for pushing the narrative forward in ways that i i don't think a lot of games really offer a lot of guidance mm-hmm. in the moment like you yeah, can read like, the rule book and they can be like, here's what you should do, you know, but as you're sitting down at the table, having something in front of you, that's like, OK, right now, here's what I need to know. Mm-hmm. And like you can see like how how if, if you are um, if you're playing fate, right, mm-hmm. y- you've got you've got like aspects in front of you. Your one of your aspects is a super cool dress. And one of your uh, aspects is single city. And, you know, you tap those, you answered yes, you you get your your plus one. Um, but by having it like really direct and having it nested within the moves, it means that uh, that first that the player doesn't need to pre-plan what they're doing and mm-hmm. like doesn't need to try to manipulate the situation in order to mm-hmm. be doing the thing. Yeah. Uh, but you still get like that same oomph. 
right. from from that kind of like qu- questions and aspects are just the same thing but flipped. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, that's actually interesting too. Is that it does keep you grounded in in playing like that sort of reactionary emotional mm-hmm. part mm-hmm. of this rather than plotting and planning ahead and you know things potentially falling apart. But it does force you to say at this very moment, wh- what now? Yeah. yeah, and it's also meant to be pretty loose how you do mm-hmm. the questions. Mm-hmm. Um, like in demand, what you deserve. One of the questions is: Are you offering something of value in return? And constantly people will be like, you need to do this thing for me. And I'll ask, are you offering something of value in return? And they'll go, not really. Can I? And I'm like, yeah, sure. Whatever. <laughs> you know, it's like, I'll, I'll give you, I'll give you this. It's and, an, it's like, cool. and it's opportunity. Now that story's for, better. <laughs> yeah. It's an opportunity for people to add things mm-hmm. to mm-hmm. the story, which again is, is another thing that I have issue with in that sort of classic GM player dynamic Mm -hmm. that a lot of us came up with. Um, And the idea that like the GM has brought a story and you are participating in their thing rather than adding to it. And I think the questions really give players an opportunity to have some agency and some narrative control. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I I also love how all of the basic moves in this game, they have two questions built into them, but every playbook has a single question attached to it as well. Mm -hmm. So no matter what basic move you stumble into, (laughs) if you're playing towards your playbook's question at all times, you're going to get that plus one right off the bat. Yeah. Yeah. Which is fantastic. As long as you don't have any conditions affecting you, uh, because conditions are the other thing. They're, you know, taken from masks, but they've got a plus one and a minus two instead Mm. of... Instead of just subtracting, and they're uh, they're different for each playbook, because uh, just another way to hone in the, the making the playbooks feel like the trope. Yeah. Um, but if you've got a plus one, like the change from a plus zero to a plus one is one of the most impactful changes in PBTA. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. Because with the range bands that we're talking about of seven to nine and ten plus that people tend to use, obviously that's not core to PBTA. It's just kind of what people tend to land on. Mm-hmm. Um, th- that statistical change is enormous yes yeah i mean mm-hmm. the difference between you know the four to six and the <laughs> the you know seven to nine is huge mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. yeah this, I, people say this game isn't crunchy this game's crunchy <laughs> <laughs> we're talking statistics in this call well, right. it's, it's sneaky crunchy because the crunch like yeah. makes it easier to play as a new player play as an existing player um it takes the pressure off of you being a funny role player or a creative or quick on your feet role player because the questions, the conditions, all of these clues are there the entire time to kind of help you get there anyway organically, which also builds more confident role players. So it's a good, it's been a gateway game for many people that I am aware of. And I think it's a very good one. Thank you. Well, I think it handles crunch differently than we traditionally think yes, of crunch exactly. too, mm-hmm. which is like, I've got to add a lot of numbers and I have all these stats to keep track of. Whereas it in this game, a lot of that crunchiness has already been handled behind the scenes as part of the design. So mm-hmm. it's it's not that I'm trying to manage a lot of moving pieces and remember what to add where and all of that kind of stuff. It's just that the the game has all of these tools already built in to mm. handle those specific circumstances. So narratively, it's there, you know, there are some moving parts, but it's it's like the design has already done the work of what to do with that crunch. I'm not trying mm-hmm. to add all of those things as I'm sitting at the table. Right. Which I appreciate Absolutely. because I don't do math. <laughs> <laughs> Well, uh, okay. Now you can ask your question. Now right? I can ask my question. <laughs> I'm done talking now for a little bit. <laughs> That's fine. Um, so we've got a, an array of playbooks, uh, and each playbook focuses on uh, a different type of personal story for that character. So, so what sort of things do characters end up doing in this game aside from the 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 romance, betrayal, murder, and and high uh, drama? Do what do don't they that? do? I know. <laughs> <That's- All right. laughs> Oh my. I mean, the 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 range. Um, throw a man overboard, steal a wife, get secretly married, have an illicit affair, 
with someone in the past, uh, hide valuable evidence in the floor of a wine cellar, burn the vineyard, um, have a very adult metaphor used to pick a lock. Um, (laughs) I mean, the list, it's, it's endless. Wrong. Am I wrong, Brandon? Like anything. Yeah. (laughs) That's one of the fun things about like putting a lot of the setting on the play sets is that the game is really meant to do any any story that the characters are pointed mm-hmm. at each other and romance and trust are just as important as important as like hate and mm. distrust mm-hmm. um that like this this doesn't work if you're playing these six people want to kill mm. each other and there's no way around it and that's what they're going to do um but like when you have when when you have the space for people that are like forming family, right? You know, like forming family, whether that's romantically forming relationships or whether that's like, you know, more platonic things. Um, and all of the difficulties of managing managing getting what you want. Mm-hmm. Like like Apocalypse World is about scarcity, right? In a lot of ways, Passion is about abundance. And that we still are not happy when we've got it. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, like, if we look at the the six core characters, right? I'm um, going to go through them real quick. La Doña, you're like a matriarch who, all of these are gender neutral, but like I'm using the genders that tend to be used in telenovelas because Spanish is, is a uh, gender structured language mm-hmm. in a way that's really difficult to avoid. Mm-hmm. Um, so La Doña, you like, you run things and you've got a bunch of power and you use that power to maintain the status quo of things you control. La Beza, you are beautiful and probably rich. People just kind of give stuff to you. It's great. <laughs> and you still want more. El Caballero, you're like one of the one of the people that's like struggling a little bit more. You're not necessarily as rich. You could be. But uh, but you want something more than you've got in this life because you came from a hard time. So you're trying you're on that path upward. Lime Playata, you are poorer than everybody else. You work really hard and you want something more. El Gemelo, your twin uh, has this wonderful, great life and you don't and you want something more. El Jefe, you control everything. You're the boss and you're, you're in charge of stuff and you're going to just tighten your grip because you want to get more. And it's all about like people going, the life that I'm in isn't satisfying me. Mm-hmm. What do I need to do? What am I willing to do? And what I'm willing to do is going to be everything mm-hmm. to get Literally the life anything. Yeah. that I want to get. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> They're not here to make friends. They're here to win. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so yeah, pretty much uh, that kind of stuff. Whatever it takes, right? Like, wh- what do you do in this show? What do you do in this game? Whatever it takes. Whatever it takes. <laughs> well, I think a thing that's interesting about telenovelas, too, is that they they play with sort of this dichotomy of like really solid tropes and like really expected thing it's like somebody's going to betray somebody somebody's going to fall in love like we know these things are going to happen but at the same time there's always some kind of twist on something right it's always like somebody's twin is not really dead and you know like mm-hmm. so there's all these constant surprises even though we know they're going to happen mm-hmm. We're still yeah. always shocked when they do because it's it's like the thing that you expectedly least expected. Yeah. And mm-hmm. and I feel like the way that the questions and moves and things are structured in this game really supports those kinds of crazy decisions as far as what characters do. It's like I'm going to do the tropiest but also least expected thing. And that is a really hard mm-hmm. <laughs> balance to land. Um, but something that I think it does happen in role playing games because we as players are like, okay, I'm going to do it. Like, I'll go for it in a way that like, obviously in a more realistic situation, you wouldn't. But, um, I think that that's a, it's a really hard, fine line to walk to is that like, I want to play with these consistent tropes that we know are going to happen, Mm -hmm. but also Mm -hmm. what a twist. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Because. Because the game, like when you when you look at um at the way incentive is structured in games, mm-hmm. um you you can start to see like how a game aims you towards uh, the behaviors they want you to do, 
Right. Um, I'm sorry. I'm in like a, I must be in like a mechanics kind of mood. <laughs> I am not stopping on these mechanics things. No, I love when we get to have um, like designers of games on the show because you get all this, we get all this like behind the scenes, like here's why it works, <laughs> you know? And that's always super intriguing to me. Like I, I always say that like my, my passion in gaming is that like balance between narrative and mechanics and like the mm-hmm. way that mechanics influence narrative it's why you can't run everything in D &D. D (laughs) because it matters it matters um it's so it just in terms of like encouraging those big swings right Mm -hmm. um like in in D &D, you're just it's such an easy thing to compare to um the incentive is to find things that you can beat and beat them so that you get money and experience yep. um you get plus ones when you make the situation more likely to benefit you um and so like you know people aim so people plan cuz people don't want to to they want to win they want to get nice they get to want to roll on tables mm-hmm. cuz rolling on tables is dope and they don't want to make a new character cuz that takes forever yeah um and in pasión like uh, we've got like, we don't have health. We've got conditions and those conditions give you a bonus. So it's mm-hmm. like, Hey, you might, ha- you, you might have to mark a condition if you want to use this super cool power. Are you willing to, to mark a condition to use this super cool power? And they're like, okay, yeah. And then it's like, okay, now you're better at fighting people. And it's like, oh, I'm better at fighting people now. And it's like, oh, let's just keep on encouraging you down that path. Let's just keep on moving you down that path. And then when you fill your conditions, you melt down and you have a big dramatic scene where you throw something away and you have got like you have, you get into a big fight. You, you cause a bunch of drama. You stir things up and then you're back to normal. Mm. And like now you get to do it again. Amazing. And like even let's let's even say things get real bad. You you you're facing certain death. One of the moves from the game. There are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight different options. Uh, so there, there are seven options before someone actually dies. Mm-hmm. Uh, so you get into the worst situation. Your character is about to die. Uh, guess what? Instead, you're going to come back with a distinctive but sexy scar. Uh, <laughs> and so that just encourages you and goes like, oh, wait, that was cool. I'm going to cross off that option because we can only do each one once. Mm-hmm. And go do it again. And so it like it, it encourages you to make big swings because when you make big swings, the on the plus side, something really cool might happen. And on the bat side, something cool might happen. Yeah. Just right. you have less control over it. <laughs> yeah. yeah, you're really rewarded for telling complicated stories and having a mm-hmm. flawed but interesting character mm-hmm. in, in ways that, again, sort of more traditional role-playing games don't do that. I always say I've played with people who are like, so afraid to fail at anything yeah. in games and i love the way that like conditions sort of encourage you to not fall into that trap of like i i want to win and the only way to win is to never fail yeah. there's this it's game's like, like mm, but also what if you become the worst version of yourself and that's a form of winning <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah because because sometimes people go into meltdown and they throw a huge fit, they cause a huge scene, they get all dramatic. And at the end of things, things are actually better for them. Right. Like, I've definitely seen pivotal moments in games where someone is like, OK, um, I mark my, you know, I can't mark a condition. I'm going into meltdown. Um, Here's what I do. And then like maybe 15 minutes later, we were just like, wow, they really took over. Like they got everything they wanted. Mm-hmm. This is <laughs> they're they're the antagonist now. Uh-huh. I think scenes like that have the potential to have such a powerful narrative effect that people really underestimate. It's a thing that I love about the most recent version of Legend of the Five Rings, too, is that mm. they have this unmasking moment where like if you fill up your your strife sort of like your emotional health track, um, yeah. you have this moment of having like a public kind of either like a social faux pas or a meltdown or, you know, and it can vary based on things. Like sometimes it's like you said something that you maybe shouldn't have said out loud. (laughs) Um, And sometimes I've had moments where it was like, I just have like a full on moment of like shock and horror and panic. And it leads to sort of these really, these very interesting narrative interactions with other players where they're like, okay, you know, we have to have this conversation that we maybe wouldn't have had otherwise or or something mm-hmm. like that. And I think I love when games sort of encourage you to be a little bit vulnerable or like show a yeah. side of yourself that you wouldn't. Mm-hmm. 
That was really the goal. It really leans into the complexity of the characters because, you know, Mm. maybe that person built up to the meltdown with a lot of actions that were selfish and then their meltdown includes you know, caring for somebody else or their feelings about someone else. And we're Mm. learning about them. And depending on who's in the room at the time, because there's always somebody, um, they're going to learn that too. And it could completely change their position within the dynamic of the group um, by having the meltdown. Yeah. It's like you've you've built this whole pyramid of lies about yourself and then suddenly somebody finds out your truth and yeah. Which Mm -hmm. they will. They always Mm. do. Right. Right. Because that's the interesting, that's the interesting option. And, yeah. And, and now I'm just picturing a Star Wars playset of Passion de las Passiones where Kylo Ren has a meltdown and breaks all the stuff in a room. And then he's oh, tired afterwards. Well, well, hold on. Hold up. <laughs> El Jefe. Because uh, he's probably El Jefe. Because let's be honest. Yeah. Like, you know, Snoke isn't one of the characters. And I guess he's an NPC. Yes. Uh, they think they can manipulate you, displace you. They don't understand. You own them. You directly confront the worst offender and hurt them. You show them that they don't that you don't need money or backup. Maybe you destroy things they love. Maybe you cut some throats. Tomorrow you'll have to wash your hands and play nice. But tonight the blood on your knuckles will match the rage in your heart. Kylo Ren. That's perfect. <laughs> Absolutely. I also love the idea that it's like you know, like you can you can do that very physically, but also as you know, as someone who who grew up socially as a girl. Um, who you can do that psychologically too. You mm-hmm. can say Absolutely. the thing that you've been thinking that you can't unsay. Mm-hmm. You know, you can you can tell them what you really think, that like statement that you can't take back, and you can really hurt somebody that way. <laughs> and I'm like, ooh, that would be fun. <laughs> <laughs> now you can see what kind of player I am and why I love this game. <laughs> Ryan, Ryan is looking at me like, ooh, you do love interpersonal conflict. Yes, you do. <laughs> it's my favorite. <laughs> and and this is a game that's meant to help people like like play in that space, right? Mm-hmm. Like mm-hmm. not everyone likes interpersonal conflict. Right. And and like I I don't think everyone needs to like interpersonal conflict. That's all good. But like this is like a so low stakes, yeah. right? Exactly. <laughs> this is like the low exactly. stakes version. That yeah. you can play in that. Which I think is really cathartic sometimes, too. Yeah. It's a thing, mm-hmm. again, I love about role-playing games. Do you know that I love role-playing games? What? Um, <laughs> I know. You're shocked. At five years I've been making a show about it, you didn't know. It's a secret. <laughs> um, but then it lets you play out some of those complicated feelings and vulnerabilities in a safe space that, like, has a defined endpoint and you are playing with people that you trust and, mm-hmm. you know, all of those kinds of things. And I I do think this game leans into some of that of like, I have the opportunity to be very open and passionate and emotional in Mm -hmm. ways that socially aren't acceptable. But like today I get to bring the drama, you know, like (laughs) I am messy and I live for drama. This is the game for me. (laughs) (laughs) I want to play this game so bad. And even like talking in terms of like play sets and stuff like that, you can also play with the level that you are doing that like i just read off the meltdown for el jefe um if you were doing like you know you could do like uh like a a period piece like uh you know go all bridgerton on it mm-hmm. and and yeah and maybe that is like you you knocked over a vase mm-hmm. and everyone is like wow that guy's got a rage problem. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> well, yeah. You know? Well, that's what I was thinking, like, with, you know, again, with the unmasking in L5R, too, it was like, like, you wrote a haiku that was, like, maybe a little too obvious, you know? So it's like, <laughs> you have the ability to, like, do the wrong thing on a very, what I called, as I was going through my divorce, petulant acts of anarchy. <laughs> um, <laughs> And you have the chance to do some of that. Like, it doesn't have to be this big, bold, like, I stab you in the chest. It can be like, I, you know, tore out the signed page of your favorite first edition novel. Mm -hmm. Like, Mm -hmm. ha, ha, ha. I I de-alphabetized your bookshelf. (gasps) How (laughs) dare you? How dare you? Too I've had low. a friend threaten to do that I, to I went me too to far. say like I'm going to disorganize your bookshelf and I was like we are not friends anymore <laughs> I, I gotta say I gotta, not lying if, if I was the GM in that case I'd be like there's a lighter sitting on there on the on the table also though <laughs> you know like because like like that's a lot of the, what the GM's role is like uh uh John Adamus of Noir World mm-hmm. said something that like blew my mind that he wrote Noir World because he wrote it the way he likes to GM mm-hmm. that 
everyone else does the that everyone else just takes actions and he gets to sit back and just watch the show. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Um, and like that's not exactly my style. Like I'm I'm uh, I'm a little bit different that I, that I like to to instigate mm-hmm. and then sit back and watch the show. Yep. Um, you sure do. <laughs> and <laughs> that's true. Um, and so like like that's what I designed the game to be doing. That I that I can throw out a little drama and then just l- give just give people the tools and let them. Let them go after their rivals, and they will. Yep. I remember playing um, Descent into Midnight, uh, and Richard Kreutzlandry was running it at one point. And, like, at one point, we were doing all this stuff, and we are like, but, oh, no. Like, what if actually this thing? And then, you know, like, we were, like, escalating the situation ourselves, mm-hmm. and— Richard literally puts his hand behind his hands behind his head. This is a familiar back, gesture. Yep, and puts his feet up on the table <laughs> and just watches <laughs> us ruin the situation for ourselves. Uh-huh. And it's, it was like it's one of the most memorable moments in playing a game for me. Is just him watching us, like you know. And some of that's having the perfect group of people too, having mm-hmm. like people that mm-hmm. like that kind mm-hmm. of story. But just like lean back and watch us ruin it for ourselves. Yep. I'm a big talker and I have to like really consciously like I I bring extra like water bottles if I'm going to be running the mm-hmm. game because I need need to not be talking the entire time like I would be mm-hmm. otherwise. But from what but Elspeth said about flowing. running it too, though, that like that is an advantage of this game is that you are as a GM also participating in it very actively mm-hmm. that, you, you know, your job is to do those things. And so, you know, going along with um what John said is like you you made the game that you want to run yeah. like you as a talker and you know an active participant while you're GMing this is the kind of game where you get to be like hmm, but what if <laughs> like you get to throw <laughs> yeah. those things in there and as much as you'd like to you know like mm-hmm. there uh, one thing that I've had people consistently say it pretty consistently say to me is that uh that this game is easier to run than most other games they've run Mm -hmm. Um, that like if they are having a tired night and they're still running, they'd rather be running this game than a lot of other games because Mm -hmm. like if you're if you're wanting to get into the brawl, if you're wanting to to throw some punches to like really push things up, you can. And if you want to just let the players do their thing, you can just like sit back and say like, all right, uh, Elspeth and Amelia, you're in a scene now. Yep. yep. Uh, where are you? Mm-hmm. Go. <laughs> and I think the questions are are part of why that works, right? Is because mm-hmm. the game has already set up and said, you know, are you dressed to impress? Like as the GM, yeah. you are not obligated to sit there and ask those questions. I I have to like I already have to answer them by the mechanics, by the rules of the game. I am required to do those story things for you. One of my favorite lazy GM tricks in this game <laughs> is the act with desperation move. Uh, which most PBTA games have some kind of avoid a negative consequence. Mm-hmm. Your your act under fire from Apocalypse World. Um, and so the questions for it for for this one are: uh, Are you doing this for love, and are you doing this for vengeance? Uh, because they're easy for the player to answer, and it tells the player what they should be doing assuming that they survive or manage to avoid this consequence. Like, uh, if they act with desperation and succeed and they're doing this for love, the next thing they should do is do something chasing their love. Mm -hmm. Uh, If they're doing this for vengeance, the next thing they should do is set up their vengeance. Mm -hmm. And so as soon as someone gets stuck in a bad situation, first off, you draw to to attention. You're in a bad situation. And then it's like a little mini conversation of like, let's talk about how you got here. Mm -hmm. Uh, And then they're going to be basically deciding the scene. Mm -hmm. So you can just, you know, sit back. Right. And (laughs) let them make trouble for themselves. Let them make (laughs) trouble. Yeah, they've gotten into trouble. Let's see how they get out of it. And let's see what they do if they do get out of it. Mm -hmm. Some of the conversations that happen just between PCs with with zero involvement based on like the stuff that happened before are just some of the most gorgeous moments of role play that I've gotten to witness. And it is like it has happened to me a couple of times where I'm watching the show and I forget that I'm in the show. Mm -hmm. Um, And I'm like, wait, are 
what? What? I got really sucked in there. <laughs> like, <laughs> so sorry. <laughs> I don't even know what the question was. Yeah, I was, we I was gonna went like circle far. back and be like, let me <laughs> let me tie it off. We make asked sure what I characters do in this game, but I feel like we've answered that, <laughs> yep. which is just uh, a little bit. Everything. Oh my god. All, all the, time. the things. Uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah. And whatever. Yep. <laughs> they <Right>? do whatever. <laughs> yep. Pretty much whatever oh would gosh. cause the most drama. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I always just say, whatever you're gonna do, do it to eleven. Like yep. mm, there's there's no meh in this game. There's no I don't have a strong <laughs> feeling one way or the other. Yes, you do. There's no room Pick for subtlety one. here. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Whatever you're doing, it it's like Brandon was saying, it's not just rearrange the books. It's set the books on fire. It's, mm-hmm. you know, whatever the worst thing you can think in that or the best thing you can think in that moment, do it mm-hmm. because you're rewarded for it uh, mechanically, but you're also rewarded for it because it's just more fun. It is. Mm-hmm. It is. Yeah. Subtlety in Pasión de los Pasiones is less like not setting the books on fire and more getting someone else to set the books on fire for you. Mm-hmm. For you. Yes. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> La Doña. <laughs> <laughs> mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Is your question, Ryan, because I already asked the, because we did them out of order. Oh, I thought you had. I, I know you're waiting for me to ask. I was, but I, I was waiting for you to ask about the what's, <laughs> what's the most unique thing about the game. We already did uh, that. We talked oh, we about did. the questions. But we did the questions. Oh. Oh, there we go. Unless you have another answer, do you is 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 there something you think that there there is that uh Passion de las Passiones does more uniquely, uh, especially in like the the breadth of PBTA games out there. Yeah, you, know, you know there's three technologies that I talk <laughs> technologies. <laughs> Nerd. <laughs> there's there's three technologies that I talk about with this game. Um as like being like the things that that I think set, set it aside from other games. Mm-hmm. Um, Shoulders of Giants. I'm, I'm. None of these are original. Uh, asking questions. Uh, asking questions for your bonuses. Mm-hmm. Um, the play sets, which we've talked about a little bit, and um, to some extent NPCs. Mm-hmm. Uh, NPCs in this game can be one of two flavors. They are first off, NPCs are always paper. Like you know, if if a player is trying to push over an NPC, they do. You know, like they're they're not the focus of the game. But um, each playset comes with a couple of NPCs, and there's an NPC deck that basically give you characters that want something. There's something you can do to take control of them. And if you have control of them, you get a special move that you get to use that uses their skills or talents in some kind of a way. Uh, And those are kind of the three things that are uh, where the tech of Pasión is. Uh, I guess technically there's some difference in conditions that the conditions give you a bonus and a penalty. Mm -hmm. Um, But like that that's masks with a slightly different Mm -hmm. (laughs) coat of paint on it. You know, Um, it is intentional because it's intentionally focusing you on going like hey uh your El, Ca- your, uh, El Caballero when you get upset uh you do things like punching people mm-hmm. and you do things like uh like accusing people of lying versus like uh your La Doña when you get in trouble you do things like demanding demanding that people do things for you and like spotting things out of place mm-hmm. that makes a lot of sense and the, yeah, the like NPC kind of, kind of deck the core things of questions is gorgeous. Like uh, every every single card, deck. yeah, it's like a like a, a full deck of cards uh, feel to it. But like every every uh, NPC card has a full picture on one side with their name, yes. and then uh, and then like a description on the back of like kind of what they want, what the role is, their mm-hmm. drive, their hook, uh, and then a move as well that's attached to them. And it's just like so succinct. That is just like one little card, and that that's all you need for this this one NPC, and, and that feels like that would be so helpful in a it game. It saved me so much. <laughs> right, <laughs> the amount of like NPCs that I just keep lists of for this game, and now I'm just like, y'all, I got a deck. Watch out. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. There, there's some there's some fun little things in the deck too. That um, uh, one thing that's in telenovelas is. Fre- that is frequently in telenovelas, not all of them, is that there uh, is, I don't want to say magical realism exactly, because some telenovelas do have it, some of them don't, mm. but uh, reality 
is frequently a little loose in telenovelas. Mm -hmm. And so that can mean like we saw something definitively, we know it's true, and then six episodes later it turns out it isn't. Mm -hmm. Um, Or it can mean that like something, that like spiritual things matter. Mm -hmm. Um, And like if there is a character that spiritually knows things, that is psychic, like that can be in a fully realistic game. Mm -hmm. Like in like a game that you would view as just like, you know, this is a modern Fully realistic, nothing different. But yes, of course, that person does. That, that person does have dreams that see the future. Mm-hmm. Um, and like that's just built into telenovelas. And that was something that uh, that I wasn't able to hit a whole lot in the core part of the mm-hmm. game, uh, except for with process your feelings. That has a little bit of psychicness in it sometimes. Um, but like, there's a couple of characters in there that just have magic powers. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it's like a deck of. I don't know how exactly how many cards it is off the top of my head, but there's there's a couple of them that are just like, yep, this character can do magic. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and, you know, you draw it and it probably won't change your game that much, mm-hmm. <laughs> but you will have like that undercurrent of like, and there are definitive uh, actual psychics in this world that hundred that have 100% accuracy yeah. and everything's good. Uh, but but yeah. you see that all the time in, in telenovelas and, and soap totally. operas where like, like one character will will just genre shift their mm-hmm. portion of the interactions with the world, but like everything else yeah. is perfectly normal, right? Absolutely. But then once this NPC is in there, wow, watch out, because mm-hmm. you know <laughs> some some off the wall sort of stuff can happen that that normally hasn't been happening in our games, and and that's really cool. Mm-hmm. Fifty four cards in the deck, by the way. 54. Okay. Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. Right on the box. I didn't even have to count. It, it tells you right on the box. So it's a standard deck. Standard, standard, standard deck. deck. Yeah, I love it. Yeah. <laughs> so before we get to the character creation, um, I'm, I'm really excited for that part. Uh, we do like talking about the history of the game, and I love talking about Woof. the history uh, with the developers themselves because uh, we, we get it right from the source. We don't have to go to a Wikipedia article. Um, <laughs> oh, the In day fact. the day I the day that I am eligible for a Wikipedia article will be the day I become truly insufferable. Uh, like, oh boy. It's already not great. I don't think you <laughs> have to be eligible. Like I think you can just make one. I think I think it would get taken down because bigger game designers than me have uh, have had uh, articles made about them and then been removed for not being uh, <laughs> for not being uh, important enough. Oh. Really? Uh, yeah, yeah. That's wild. It seems like there are lots of things already on Wikipedia that are not important. Not, not important. Not at all. But gamers are so vengeful oh. <laughs> that uh. like they'll like take their weird little beefs and be like, "This person isn't notable this just because they made historical games historical enough." The- <laughs> <laughs> all right. All right. So wh- history of Passion. Yes. Wh- when did you <laughs> oh start goodness. working on Passion? Oh my gosh! I should know this because it coincides with uh, with the release of Stop Hack and Roll. Oh, um, let me. I'm, oh, I feel like I'm, it's I'm been typing. like six, seven years. That's right. Yeah. I, well, I, like I, I know you were working on it and talking about it when we recorded five years ago. So yeah, I, I, re- I remember I think, it was one of the earlier episodes. You're like, "Whoa, maybe I should work on this." It was episode six. Yeah. Uh, Stop, Hack, and Roll started October 2015, Ooh. and it's bi-weekly, so whatever that means. <laughs> it rose that right like in seven there, years, right? yeah. Yeah, so, so yeah, it's this 15, 16, 17, 18, yeah, like seven years at this point. Wow. Wow. And it started out, uh, like, you know, needless to say, when it started out, it was not taking big swings. Uh, this Pasión dos Pasiones is the first... I, I can't say it's the first game that I put serious time into, but it's the first game that I took put serious time into writing that wasn't like me as a kid making a heartbreaker, mm-hmm. right? Like that wasn't like, yeah, I could write a 500 page <laughs> game with 200 <laughs> skills. The problem with D&D, the problem with GURPS is that it doesn't have enough skills, actually. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> and I've I'm often like, said that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. That's, everyone says it. Uh-huh. We all know it. It's an open secret in the yeah. tabletop space. But like, you know, the first game that I kind of looked at like as an adult, I guess, mm-hmm. 
was Pasión de las Pasiones. And uh, it started out as just an episode of Stop, Back and Roll that James and I were kind of noodling with. And at the end of the episode, I was like, yeah, you know, maybe maybe I'll, I'll put a little bit more time in this. See if there's anything. See if it's got legs. <laughs> and, uh, and did it? Yeah, no, they're it turns hot. Out, they're they're so turns sexy. Out nobody, nobody wants. Yeah. <laughs> uh, right, everybody's like, no one else was like, it's the sexiest it's, legs. It's right. so much sex legs, legs for days. Legs yes. for days. days. <laughs> Again, another reason we need a magical girl genre uh, place. Please. <laughs> uh, and so then I think Metatopia 2016, I I went for the first play test of it. The first. The first time anybody had ever played the game. Mm. Um, the week before, uh, we, we'd like, come back and done a couple of other, other episodes. I had started to like really spin off in my own direction with it. Um, and like the week before Metatopia, I was desperately writing playbooks. Mm. And I was stressed out. I was freaking out. And um, and both both my my partner and buddy James and uh, and my my very supportive wife, Aaron, asked uh like why i was so stressed out about it and like what the worst case scenario would be and i was like worst case scenario is i go to sit down and mark diaz truman from magpie games is sitting at my table <laughs> like that would be the absolute so worst bad. case scenario it would be so bad because i'd be terrified i wouldn't be able to run it uh and like it would, at the point at that point the game was GMless, mm -hmm. um, and so like I wouldn't even be running it, but it would be too intimidating. Couldn't make it happen, I impossible. And dear reader, uh, I get to meditate. What do you think happened? <laughs> I think I we can all see where this is going. <laughs> yeah, uh, first game, first time the game ever was played. Mark Diaz Truman was sitting at the table with me, mm -hmm. and uh, it went really well. <laughs> and <laughs> afterwards, he said, like you know, like hey, here's my card. Uh, don't leave New Jersey without talking to me. And we got back together and like we talked about like, you know, Latinidad and like how 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 difficult it is to like publish something that feels personal to our culture and personal to like who we are as like as as Latinos in a tabletop space that like now has a lot of uh, racial vibrancy. And at the time, you less know, so. in terms of published games, less so. Mm -hmm. Like Metatop last last time I went to Metatopia, I'm like I, I haven't been going with the pandemic. Uh, I, I don't think it's even been running in person because of the pandemic. Um, last time I went, there were all like we we filled an empanadas place with uh, like almost exclusively Latino designers. First time I went, like we were a handful of people, mm -hmm. and like it it seemed impossible to take like this niche game. Like, like Mark joked, uh, that joked half seriously that he thought someone was pranking him with Pasión de los Pasiones. Uh, because like, what would this, you know, like, like who is it's, this it's like for? bait for him. Right. Yeah. Like, uh, and so, uh, he basically said to me, like, Hey, if you want to publish your own game, if you want to be your own publishing company, let me know. I'll help you out. Um, if you don't want to think about business, let me know and we'll publish you. And I was like, I don't want to learn about the publishing business. Mm -hmm. And so started working with him and working with Brendan Conway, who's another of my big gaming heroes. Yep. Like, you know, I was planning a masks podcast at the time. I think we hadn't quite la launched yet. And uh, and j just got to writing with them. Uh, the Ashcan was pretty similar to what I had had, uh, had tested. Mm -hmm. And uh, then things kind of rolled from there we kicked off the kickstarter in february of 2020 mm. uh and i i had recently become a dad and like had like a new job and it was a stressful time and then the pandemic kicked in a month later and so we we've gotten the book out later than i would have liked to but like you know things things are just like you know it do be like that. Yeah. 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 And like, I, I do think the, I, I think the game is better for it. It got yeah. a ton more testing. It got a ton more tightening. Um, we basically were able to make it the smoothest version of the game that it could be, I think. Mm -hmm. And that's really what I wanted. I want it to be a game that you can, that you can bring to a group of people that have never played a game mm -hmm. and have them have like a really satisfying experience that invites them to play more. Yeah. And I want it to be, 
uh, here's where I started to get emotional. I want it to be a game that like, I wanted it to be a game that like a group of, of uh, Latina people could get together and play a game and like have built in in jokes in it, you mm-hmm. know, and like really like revel in some some culture, some Latinidad, some togetherness in it. And it has become that mm-hmm. like uh, I, I love any time I get to play when I am playing at like an all Latinx table. It's like it's a whole different thing. Yeah. And it's so nice uh, <laughs> at at this point. Games are are uh, some of them are still shipping um, from the Kickstarter. Mm-hmm. Um, there was some slowdown in Europe, uh, and I think for the the worldwide shipment as well. But a whole lot of people have copies on their desks. People have been starting to send me pictures of their local game store that, like you know, their local game store kickstarted and has a, has some copies selling. Uh, January tenth, we started the pre order, mm-hmm. and uh, Valentine's Day is the official. Official, official, official launch. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, yeah. And that should be uh, coming out after our uh, second episode, right after our second episode's public mm-hmm. launch. Ooh. All right. So, so you can you can pre-order your PDF and have it on Valentine's Day. Absolutely. Uh, pro- if you're getting your physical on the day that this comes out, if you're ordering your physical on the day this comes out, I don't know if it'll be there by Valentine's Day. Yeah. It'll be there pretty soon after, I but, think. But yeah, this book is gorgeous. Uh, the layout is fantastic. And I love... Oh my All god, they did such the, a good job. I love that was the other thing I did not want to learn layout. <laughs> my goodness, the pictures in this book are phenomenal. Uh yeah. for just capturing that that uh telenovela feel as mm-hmm. well. I just remember, um, Brandon, when you first saw the picture, like the cover picture. I, I don't know why I was around you, but I just remember you going, I didn't expect it to be this hot. Look how hot this is. Like, yeah. I just didn't know it was gonna be like this. And I was like, Whoa. Yeah. <laughs> it was it was very funny because, like, it's I steamy. knew it's steamy. It's steamy. It is. It's, it's really so nice. sexy. I knew when I started working with Magpie that it was going to be that it was going to look beautiful, right? Like, I've got a bunch of Magpie mm-hmm. games, um, mm-hmm. and like, I know personally the team, and like, I knew that they were going to do an amazing job with it. Seeing how it has, seeing like the the art choices that were made, um, seeing like the layout choices that were made, like, it's. It, it makes me so happy. And like yeah. there's there's if like uh like like the deck, for example, like flying back there for a second, the deck is just like 54 beautiful Latinx people. Mm-hmm. <laughs> the the book is full of Latinx people. The 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 it was made. It was made with a with a whole bunch of Latinx people on the team. Mm-hmm. Um and it it carries that. Uh, like uh, Miguel, who did the the layout and like worked a a lot of that, like has has helped to make this gorgeous. The 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 folks that picked out the the stock art, like I I got to just like approve some stock art at various points, and it was just like, yeah, I have like fifty windows open, where I'm just going like, beautiful next, beautiful next, beautiful <laughs> next. Like we we intentionally have people like we it's all stock art um mm-hmm. and then like um visual flourishes mm-hmm. um but like we we very intentionally aimed to include like a a wide spectrum of of um of race because like uh Latinx whether it's a race or not is always so complicated right and like that includes people that are that are black that includes people that are are white that includes people that are indigenous and so we wanted to include all of that in the game we wanted to to show that we wanted to uh we wanted to to show that romance is not just a a uh dude with dark hair and blue eyes Mm -hmm. and a chick with uh, dark hair and blue eyes like most telenovelas are you know like Mm -hmm. we're trying to be better than the source material uh and so all of that was so much fun, mm-hmm. uh, and just you know, it's it's it is it has been such a journey. It's but writing is hard. I'm not <laughs> a fan of writing. Uh, I love designing games, mm-hmm. and the amount of help I've gotten on this has been truly tremendous. Like, I just get emotional. It's 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 it was so it was so much work to do. 
And it is so gratifying being at this point that like, you know, I can move my head a little bit and I've got copies of the book back here. Yeah. I've got like my name written there. And but but it wasn't just me. It was it was this team that is just so incredible. Absolutely. Just so truly incredible. I love getting to collaborate with people on creative projects because I think there's yeah. a lot of times where you're like I have this idea and I know what I want and then you start working with somebody else and you're like yes that's the thing mm -hmm. that's what I like and I couldn't have gotten there myself you know yeah. like, I always think that too like you know when you commission art and things like that too you're like yes that you, that was what was in my head or mm -hmm. you know when they come back to and you're like I didn't even know I wanted that but now I really do mm -hmm. <laughs> you know yeah. and it's always and exciting it, it, when you like when you're like yes that is what was in my heart <laughs> you yeah. know and like it starts to feel like so personal because like uh like you know needs to say i have no idea who any of these people are that are on the pictures of the art right, right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like they're they are stock art pictures but like uh earlier on in the in the episode you held up a picture of a card you held up one of the cards and uh and that is uh inez galbaron she was the first NPC card that we showed on the Kickstarter. Oh. She was, I had her pulled up on my phone and like what well, I realized that I'd in like mid 2021, I realized that I still had a tab open that was like the uh, Dropbox link that was like, hey, we're thinking of using this piece of art. What do you think? Um, and then I just like not ever closed it. Yeah. Uh, and like when you open <laughs> up the deck of cards, the first card you pull out is that one. Mm -hmm. And it's like, like, yeah, like, you know, that's a part that's a part of this journey that is now arrive that is now like, arriving on people's desks yeah like now the, a real game here in germantown wisconsin it's yeah, you know, yeah. like <laughs> <laughs> i have it <laughs> and it's just it's so exciting and like i'm i am still i'm still on that journey yep. because <laughs> tormentas is in work um and it's coming together just great it's going to be a much faster time scale on this second book than the first mm. book um but like, it's funny talking about like, you know, like mentioning playbook examples and I want to be like, and El Vifador does this. And it's like, no, Brandon. <laughs> <laughs> Rain it in. That's for that later. One's, <laughs> that one people can't buy on Valentine's Day. That one's but it's, <laughs> but it's coming soon. It's coming Fun soon. <laughs> well, uh, I, I think we've gone through uh, most of the basic concepts for this game in terms of what we need to know before we create the characters, but is there any other tidbits that we might need to know before we, before we just die right in? Um, you, you know, there's one thing that I, that I, I used to be better about saying on interviews and I've, I've kind of stopped in part because of like what we were talking about that. I think that the, that the online community at least has gotten more used to having like, uh, books about and from POCs and, and like books about and from marginalized groups, um, that, uh, one of the rules I put into Pasión is that uh, you're playing Latino characters. Mm -hmm. So like uh, whether whether like w w what that means, like, you know, th there's there's an enormous breadth of Latinidad. Uh, but that I'm going like, you know, like, hey, uh, if you're playing by the rules, you got to play someone uh, who's Latinx. Uh, and so that has been a thing that. I think is is important to it because it is going like, you know, these tropes are tropes, but they're also things that we see in ourselves, right? It's very easy to read the playbooks, I think, and go like, yeah, I see this in myself. This thing about this feels like myself. This condition feels like myself. And I want to have that experience of of connecting empathetically to these characters and like experiencing these characters and, and having the emotions of these characters mm -hmm. and being like, yeah, and these are latinx characters uh and so that's just the thing that i'm excited about that's a that i think is a big part of the game which is that is that is the thing that i that i've also had like people going like uh hey can i make can i make a uh, gay drama and i've go like yeah sure but uh but that is technically breaking the rules so you'll need to make that your own game and publish it and make money off of it so, so get on out there uh -huh. and do that yeah yeah get paid get paid i can, I can <laughs> definitely see taking the K drama and uh re revamping all the playbooks to to have the <laughs> the, the 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 you know the korean backdrop there and yeah and yeah. uh it would it would be just as good with with this whole other like you know side uh, uh kind of like a sister genre to the telenovelas yeah, absolutely absolutely 
So get on it, people. I think the yeah. only thing that I would add as a person playing this game who is not Latinx is because you are playing Latinx characters, you have to do so as authentically and organically and with as much respect for your character as you would if they looked and acted and were from the same source as you are. And that includes not leaning into derogatory stereotypes, not mm-hmm. doing jokey voices. Like if this is something I, Brandon explained, like explained it really well up in the in the <laughs> beginning, but like if this is something of your heritage and you know, it's organic and natural to you to do that. Okay. But me as a white lady, no, I'm not doing any accents period. Mm-hmm. Um, because that just like leans into a place of somebody, maybe me, maybe somebody else accidentally doing something that is against the love that is, this is a love letter to telenovelas mm-hmm. from my mm-hmm. perspective. Mm-hmm. And if we're not leaning into the love of it and, um, then we're doing it wrong. So mm-hmm. for the people that I speak to that are like, I don't feel like I can play this game because I'm white or, or, you know, not Latinx. I say, as long as you do it with the love, admiration and respect that you would play any other game, you're not going to mm-hmm. mess up. You're not going to hurt anyone. You just have to keep that in mind. And mm-hmm. most mm-hmm. people end up absolutely loving it. So that's the only thing I would add. Absolutely. And and if you do mess up, you, you take it with humility. And yeah. you, you do your best and you, you, you make yourself better. Mm-hmm. Like, I don't want people to be afraid to play this game. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, for the twin reason of I think it's a good game that people can make connection with that they wouldn't be able to otherwise. And because when people play this game, I get a check. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but like it's it it's important for people to simultaneously feel comfortable and jump into it. and also not feel like they have to like step back from it. Like, you know, I, I don't, I, I'm not at anybody's table, but, um, but if, if, if I'm at, if I'm at the table and someone's like, yes, so my character is Bobby Sue and he's from Oklahoma. Uh, then I'm a little bit like, (laughs) what are you doing? Why? (laughs) Yeah. Why, why, why this game? Yeah. Why this character with this game? Yeah. Uh, and so that's kind of why I like made it like a, a, a part of the rules. It's in the book. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I, I do like how uh, you pointed of... out there, like if, if there is going to be an, an like an American character, uh, you know, non Latinx uh, in the story, they're probably mm-hmm. the businessman that's coming to try to buy up the hotel or something. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Because th- those characters are there 100 yeah. uh, percent. They, they just tend to be kind of the bad guy. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, like, you know, y- you don't need to play with that. But uh but your characters, are, your characters are the main characters of a telenovela. Mm-hmm. What are we doing if they're not Latinx? Exactly. I think role playing games too are one of the the few sort of media pieces that give us a chance to explore empathy in a way that almost no other um, play form or media really mm-hmm. really does. Is that mm-hmm. we get the chance to inhabit another person's you know, experiences too. And so I think that this is, you know, as a white person looking at this game, this gives me the chance to sort of inhabit that and like, you know, bond with it. And, and, you know, you talked about like seeing yourself in your character too, is like a chance to say like, okay, these experiences are pretty universal. Absolutely. That like, we don't you know, have like to look obviously to your cultural background is different than mine and your experiences are different than mine. But it gives me a chance to say like, oh, these are things that I recognize from my own life that like, OK, we're not. It's almost know. like humans are all humans. Whoa. <laughs> Whoa. Like people are people. I came and, here to talk about like, games, Brian. Um <laughs> <laughs> I try to keep politics out of my games, actually. Right, yeah. Um, and I mean, like, it's... Oh, my, this la- is the, Latinx people are people, too. <laughs> and, like, this is the kiddie pool, right? Like, yeah. like, this is not Steal Away Jordan. This is not, like, like a intense emotional exercise, mm-hmm. right? And, like, and that's okay. It's not meant to be. Mm-hmm. Um, but although I cannot be at everyone's table, I am sitting here going, if you're if you're not playing Latinx characters, you're not playing Pasión de Pasiones. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Right. Yep. <laughs> and I'm sitting here saying if you're making a joke out of a character that you're playing, then you're not exploring empathy and you're not playing the game right. 
Right. There you go. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. We're in your home always mm-hmm. watching. <laughs> yeah, we are watching. Yeah. You. Well, and, yeah. I, and I, I, can't, I think I can't come to your table because I am uh, because I only hide in your attic. Yep. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so I can't be at your, unless your table is at your in your attic. <laughs> Brandon right. is the gif of the witch going down into the trap door basement, <laughs> cackling. <laughs> but flipped upside down. Yep. Yeah. I yeah. think it's important, too, to realize that, like, you know, like, you can still have fun. Your character still can be. Totally. You know, like. They are. Yeah. Right. You know, and like you said, like, as long as you're not making a joke of it. And it's like, I, I don't think that is to say that, like you can't be ridiculous. It's just that no, like yeah. the heritage needs to not be the part that you're being ridiculous about. Correct. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that absolutely. is exactly what um, I mean. Your character can be hilarious. Your trope can be leaned into, should be mm-hmm. leaned into. That is not at all what I mean. It's it's you as a person yeah. being disrespectful. Mm-hmm. That's mm-hmm. what I mean. Latinx people also funny sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> mm-hmm. One or two sometimes. of them. Sometimes. One or two of them. <laughs> Pedro Pascal got a lot of very funny interviews. Uh, the, the man knows how to crack a joke. You'd never know it from what they cast him. All in, right. <laughs> the man knows how right? to make a joke. <laughs> Call to action. Yeah, like that. I'm really excited that we finally got to cover this game. Oh, it's, yeah. It's been five years in the making. It's been on our list since we originally recorded with Brandon, yeah, um, back for series two, which, like I said in these episodes, is Ben, like was before we officially launched, yeah, and back when you didn't know what a, what a playbook was. Oh, I know, yeah. poor baby Amelia. <laughs> um, and he mentioned it like in his intro as a thing that he was working on, and I was like, discuss, yes, um, it, and yeah. so now finally we finally got to discuss it, and so that was exciting, yeah. Um, it, this I, is such I'm a good game. so happy that uh, all the schedules lined up for this because I, I know Elsbeth was like probably number one super fan of this yes. game and like uh, is is a really good uh, real life friend of Brandon. Uh, mm-hmm. They they've known each other for such a long time. Uh, they were on Protean City Comics together and. Like uh, having them two together, uh, yes. really great chemistry, and uh, this game is just so good. It's so good. It is it's so, so good. good. Like just narratively, mechanically, like yeah, a masterpiece. Absolutely, it's great. absolutely. It's great. Um, I, if if Brandon doesn't submit it to the Ennies, I'll I'll have to have words with him. Uh, mm, that's a good point. My goodness, this this game is is up there in what it's going to be one of the probably most influential uh, PBTA games uh, of this generation of PBTA, I think. Wow. I, th- I think it's up there in terms of the, the role with questions. Yeah. Like, I Huge. have not seen a game do it like that before. Mm-hmm. And it's it's already making waves, like even mm-hmm. before this version came out. So, yeah, Brandon, yeah. get on it. Do it. <laughs> Before we sign off for this episode, we do have a couple calls to action. First up, it's Girl Scout cookie time again. Uh, the long anticipated best time of the year. Only thing that's good about the middle of winter. <laughs> Girl Scout cookie time. Uh, my daughter is once again selling cookies for the Girl Scouts. Uh, it would help her tremendously if you would buy some cookies from her. We made it super easy this year. Uh, you can just head over to cookies.charactercreationcast.com. A little a little branding. Um, <laughs> and that'll take you right to Eleanor's page where you can order to your heart's content. Uh, if you don't already have a Girl Scout in your life that you would rather buy cookies from, you can feel free to buy cookies from Eleanor and they will get shipped right to your door. I said it last year and I'll say it again this year. If you do have local Girl Scouts... Um, You can definitely support them. Mm. It will not hurt my feelings um, because the money does go right to the the troops and their activities and things Mm. like that. So it's it's great. Um, But if you don't have a Girl Scout and you just really want some Thin Mints, cookies.charactercreationcast.com is here to help you out. Get your cookies, people. Get your cookies. (laughs) Uh, Well, next up, uh, we've made some phenomenal progress so far on our Necromancer and Magical Girl Fusion game. 
called Undying Bond. Uh, we are actually recording ourselves every step of the way. Uh, and last week's episode, I believe, really set us in a really great direction for the game. Yeah, we um, had a lot done. <laughs> we um, did, and, and it spurred a lot of thoughts afterwards. So I'm yeah. um, really, really <laughs> excited for the next session. Yeah. So we, th we think this game is going to be something special when we are done with it, and we would love to have you on this journey with us. Uh, you can check out our Patreon at patreon.com slash character creation cast in order to hear all of the latest design discussions uh, that uh, we're making at the $5 and up level. Um, you'll also get a bunch of other bonus content, uh, but we've really been enjoying this process together. It's been a lot of fun. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm so excited. Like, looking at it, I'm like, I, there's a long way to go yet. Oh, yeah. um, but I'm excited about where it's headed. Exactly. So. In addition to the Undying Bond series, you'll also get weekly chit chats between Ryan and me where we talk about whatever's on our minds for 15 to 60 minutes. And let's be honest, it's usually closer to 60 minutes because we really love talking yeah. uh, about everything, honestly. <laughs> um <laughs> You can also get personal thank you cards, Zoom hangouts with us and other patrons at higher levels, which are always a blast, mm -hmm. as well as personal thank yous right here on our episodes. As mentioned at the top of the show, we have a brand new patron joining us since our last recording. Ooh. Yay! Uh, so, Cole McCallum, thank you so very much for your generosity and support. We are thankful to have you here with us and happy to see you joining in the discussion uh, in our Discord channels as well. Absolutely. Uh, thank you so much. And in addition to Cole, we also would like to thank those of you still supporting our show every month. It truly warms our hearts that you are here with us. So, Lieutenant, our first patron, we can't thank you enough, but we'll absolutely keep trying. Many thanks to DJG Tigranosaurus. Eric Bonds, thank you so much. Matt Newton, thank you so much. Thank you, Shadim Cabal. We couldn't do this without you. We are very glad to have you here, Daryl Holliday II. Thank you for supporting us. Many thanks to the shyest barbarian. And congratulations on your official name change. Absolutely. <laughs> Benjamin Sweeney, many thanks to you. We appreciate your support. Lorcan McGinnis, thank you. Rob Fletcher, thank you for helping us make this show. Kevin Brown, thank you so much. <laughs> and Tentacle Duck, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> John Adamus, uh, thank you for your continued support. And A3 Sketchpad, we can't thank you enough. And a thank you to all our supporters in the future. We couldn't make the show as easily without your assistance. And uh, speaking of which, as of this recording, we are actually only three $5 patrons away from breaking even with the revenue uh, combined with, from our ads. So That's very exciting. That is very exciting. Uh, if we double that, uh, we'll finally be making some money back on this show, uh, which Dang. is pretty fantastic. Uh, and we would be over the moon if we could accomplish that. So if you want to join this list of fantastic folks and help us out in the process, please head on over to patreon.com slash character creation cast to find out about all the amazing stuff our Patreon has to offer. Having said all of that, we are incredibly grateful that you are choosing to spend time with us here, uh, whether you're supporting us financially or just listening to what sounds interesting to you. Uh, if you want to support us in a different way, please feel free to recommend the show to other folks online or in person. If you still talk to people in person, right. um, just walk up to people on the streets and shout, have you heard of Character Creation Cast? <laughs> um, you can also leave a rating or review on Apple Podcasts, Podchaser, or even Podcast Addict or our Facebook page. We do read those out when we have new ones to read, which we don't right now, unfortunately. But what that does mean is we've hit the end of our episode, so we'd like to bid you adieu. Until next time, take care, everyone. Please stay safe. Drink some water. Compliment a friend. Shout at strangers about podcasts. <laughs> Enjoy the rest of your week and keep making those amazing people. We'll see you next time.
thank you for joining us for part one of this character creation series. We'll be back in part two, picking up right where we left off. Character Creation Cast is a production of the One Shot Podcast Network and can be found online at www.charactercreationcast.com. Head to the website to get more information on our hosts, this show, and even our press kit. Character Creation Cast can also be found on Twitter at CreationCast or on our Discord server at discord.charactercreationcast.com. I'm one of your hosts, Ryan Bolter, and I can be found on Twitter at Lord Neptune or online at lordneptune.com. Our other host, Amelia Antrim, can be found on Twitter at Ginger Reckoning. Music for this episode is used with a Creative Commons license or with permissions from the podcast they originated from. Further information can be found within the show notes. Our main theme music is Hero, remixed by Steve Combs, and is used with a Creative Commons license. This podcast is owned by us under Creative Commons. This episode was edited by Ryan Bolter. Further information for the game systems used in today's guest can also be found in the show notes. If you'd like to support our show, find us on Patreon. Get access to bonus episodes, extra outtakes, and much more at patreon.com slash character creation cast. Thanks for joining us. And remember, we find the best part of any role-playing game is character creation. So go out there and create some amazing people. We'll see you next time.